phone, but he won't prosper. Darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. My God. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus Every war he wages he will win And I'm not backing down from any giants I know how this story ends Yes, I know
Good morning, church. How are you guys doing this morning? All right. We got to get a little louder than that now. How, how's everybody doing this morning? That's better. Man, you guys didn't even outdo the first service, that first one, man. That's a good job, though, on the second one. So whenever you guys came in, uh, you got a connection card, especially if this is your first time. Please fill out as much of that as you guys feel comfortable doing. I um, want to welcome you to church. My name's Josh. I'm super excited you guys are here. Being uh, hosting this morning, I get to see the first version of this, and uh, you guys are in for a treat. Um, we're going to get back to worship this next one. This is probably my favorite song that, they, that these guys have ever done. And even they really enjoy it. There's a lot of energy on stage. So you guys enjoy worship and I'll come back at the end.
There will be a victory worship you. Father, I thank you that there will be victory here, not by our strength, Father, but by yours. God, that the battle is already won. It was won 2,000 years ago on the cross. Father, I thank you for that. We get to call ourselves um, children of God. Father, I thank you for the message that's about to be brought. Um, Father, a message of breakthrough. I thank you for this testimony that's about to be shared. Father, that, uh, that it's an illustration of what Christ can do in us. Father, I pray um, that you would open our hearts and our minds um, to what you have to speak um, to us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. How are y'all doing today? My name is Penny Trammell. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ who has been freed and delivered from methamphetamines. I would like to tell you a little bit about my story today. I only have about three minutes, so um, I'd like to start by saying that um, God's been so good. I grew up in a great home. My family and my father was a chief of police who worked very hard for his family. My mother stayed home and took care of us kids. Neither of my family had any kind of issues with drugs or alcohol. But about 15 years ago, I had a car accident and was put on pain pills. The pain pills just wasn't enough, though, to help with the pain. So one day I was introduced to meth. And that was the worst day of my life because from then on, I ended up losing everything that I had. My marriage of almost 15 years, my new home, my job as a dental assistant for 14 years, I went into a downhill spiral. <clears throat> I then met Don, and of course, we started doing drugs together, and I moved in with him, and after about a year, we started having some major issues in our relationship. See, drugs will take everything that you love or care about. We lived in sin for many years. Come December 2016, Don left our home and told me to pack up and move out. He just couldn't live this lifestyle anymore. So he cut off all communication with me, and come January the 1st of 2017, I moved out of our home. I had sold almost everything that I had to live on and to support my drug habit. For the next two months, I got deeper into my addiction, not caring if I woke up to see another day. All along, I was praying, asking God to please help me, that I was so lost and I didn't know what I was going to do. Then I received a call from my mom that day. She wanted me to come home. She said that she would help me get through what I was dealing with. So I did, but I just couldn't get over losing my soulmate. So I continued to use drugs until February the 17th of 2017, when Don finally contacted me. He had told me that he still loved me and that he had been in church and celebrate recovery here at Crossroads, getting help for his addictions. That day was the last time I used. He agreed to see me so we could talk and guess where the first place he brought me to was, Crossroads Church and celebrate recovery here. 
Thank God for that. That was the best thing we could have ever done. So we both started coming together, and we also started going to Maysville Baptist Church's CR, working the steps. Don and I was baptized on April the 30th of 2017 at Hurricane Shows Park, and Pastor Rod married us on May the 23rd of 2017 at Hurricane Shows Park. We are leaders of Celebrate Recovery, and I will be celebrating four years of sobriety next month. Thank you. God is good. Don and I are very happy together, and God has blessed us with our sweet Nikolai. That has been such a blessing to our family. We have an amazing small group with the gums. And God has restored our relationships with our family and has given us back everything the devil has stole from us. So if you don't think that he can't, look at me because I'm living proof of what God really can do. So thank you for letting me share. Don't you just love it? Don't you love that our God is a God of comebacks? And he tells that story over and over and over again in the lives of the people who know him. God is a God of comebacks. In fact, that's what we've been celebrating these last few weeks, that this year can be the year of the comeback for you and I. We've looked at coming back to God. We've looked at coming back to life. And today I want to talk about coming back to confidence. And that might sound like a very weird title. Um, it actually made me think of what's called the Consumer Confidence Index. You ever heard of what that is? Uh, it's, it's all these different um, economic factors that they put in a pot and they boil it up together and, and determine how willing people are to spend money, invest money, or, or not do that. And, and so it goes up and it goes down based on the economy and all these different factors. Except for some of you, no matter what the economy is doing, your, your consumer confidence index is up. It's always up. You're always ready to spend a little money, right? I know who you people are, all right? Um, no, having confidence is a good thing. I believe God wants to, us to go through this life in, with confidence, but he wants us to have the right kind of confidence. If you and I have confidence in the wrong things, it's actually destructive to our lives, and so I think if this last year has taught us anything, that you and I should not have total confidence in uh, government. You and I should not have total confidence in politicians or technology or the opinions of others or our own personal success or even in ourselves. Today, what I want to do together is look at where does God confidence come from? And so we're going to be looking together at Joshua chapter 2 and then Hebrews 11. You can kind of stick your finger in both of those. We'll have the verses on the screen. Let me set the scene. The Israelites had been delivered from slavery. They had wandered in the desert for 40 years. Moses had died, their great leader, and he had passed the baton of leadership to a man named Joshua. And Joshua was to bring them into the promised land. The first city they come to is they cross the Jordan River into the west side of the Jordan into the promised land is a city called Jericho. And Jericho was super fortified. It had huge, thick, high walls. It was going to be a problem. And so Joshua sent in spies to, to scout it out and try to figure out a game plan for the battle. Uh, they meet a woman named Rahab, and, and they stay in her house. And Rahab is actually a prostitute. And, and this is going to shock some of us, but Rahab, the prostitute, is actually the hero of our message today. And as we learn about confidence, there's a comeback that happens in her life that you and I can learn from. So Rahab takes these spies in. The king finds out about it, the king of Jericho. He sends his men to get the spies. And in a really surprise move, Rahab hides the men and then lies and protects them and keeps them from being taken by the king. And now we pick up the story in verse 8 in Joshua chapter 2. It says this. Uh, before, before the spies laid down for the night, she, Rahab, went up to the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what he did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, who you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth 
below. Now, those are some really amazing words that come out of the mouth of Rahab, aren't they? But she's articulating basically what her actions were already saying, that she was ready for a comeback. This was a turning point in Rahab's life. I mean, just think about it. Her profession would have made her the lowest of lows in her society, despised and thought of as nothing. You know what that tells us? I don't care who you are or where you've been. It is never too late for a comeback. You are never too low for a comeback. It's never too far gone for a comeback. When you and I open our hearts to the living God like Rahab does. Because our God is the God of comebacks. So let's examine what she says for a second here. That little passage we just read in Joshua 2, we're going to unpack some of the things he said. It's amazing that we can see where her confidence comes from. She's basically saying this. Look, I know this horrible thing is about to happen to our people. That the God who's conquered these other kings are going to conquer us too. Yet in the midst of what is horrible in the eyes of everyone else, she says, I see the handiwork of God moving in our midst. I know that this is God's work, what he's doing here. You know what that tells me? Maybe this past year has been difficult for you. Maybe God's put you on a path you would not have chosen and you've faced hardships and difficulties you never thought you would ever have to face. And yet somehow, some way, God has come through for you too. I love what she says. She says, we already know, I know that God has given you this land. Now that's a confident, bold statement, right? God's already given you this land. And I wonder where did that confidence come from for her? She knew what the spies were only hoping for. She knew God had already given them this land. It made me think of Hebrews chapter 11. It says this, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and being certain about what we do not see. She was confident in God despite her past and despite her limited knowledge of him. She knew without a shadow of a doubt that God was going to do this work. Scripture also says this in Romans 10. It says, faith comes from hearing the message. Faith comes from hearing the message. And I think in that passage we just read, she said, we all heard about what God has been doing. That's kind of a key word. You may want to circle it. She said, we've heard about this God of yours, and we've heard about what he's been doing. And because of what we've heard, that is where her confidence lied, because she had heard about God and his power and his ability to do for his people. Let me tell you something. In our culture, what we say is seeing is believing, right? Seeing is believing. If I can touch it, if I've witnessed it with my own eyes, if I can scientifically prove it, then I'll believe it. But you know what God says? He says, faith is being sure of what you do not see. And actually, you can have faith simply from hearing what God has to say and what God has done. God says, hearing's enough. See, let me just tell you something. If you're waiting to see God move supernaturally in your life, if you've got to see something for yourself in order for you to believe, I want you to know you might be waiting your entire life and it'd be too late. God doesn't say you have to see something. What God says is you need to hear something. And you can hear the message of Christ and the living God and respond to him. Hearing is enough. This is what she had heard. I want you to see in this passage we just read. She heard a couple things about God. First of all, she said, we've heard about this whole Red Sea thing. You can read about it uh, for yourself in Exodus chapter 14. Forty years prior when the Jews were being delivered from slavery in Egypt, they were backed up with their backs against the wall to the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army was bearing down on them, and they cried out to God, and God separated the waters of a sea. And he built these huge walls of water on either side. And this wind blew so hard, it dried out the land on the bottom of the sea. And the million plus people of Israel marched across the dry land. And God delivered them to the other side. And then the Egyptians followed in, thinking they would pursue the Israelites. And God allowed the waters to come over them and, and destroy them. I said, we heard about that. We know that your God did that. We know about your God and how powerful he is. And then she heard about the victories. 
She said, we heard about what happened to the Amorite kings, how, how just a few months ago you defeated them, and actually doesn't say it in the story, but other kings on the other side of the Jordan had been defeated by the Israelite people because God had gone before them and given them victory in the battles. So here's what I'm trying to say. For Rahab, her confidence in God, even though she knew very little about him, her confidence in God, even though of her past, her confidence in God came from knowing what God had already done. That's it. That that is literally when we talk about where does confidence come from for you and I and have God confidence, it's simply recognizing what God has already done and responding in faith, seeing that he's already been faithful. Let me just ask you, can you look back in your life and see the handiwork of God at work in your life and you say, man, there was no way out and I had no options and I didn't know what was going to happen and how I was going to make a way. And yet somehow I'm here today and it was the handiwork and the faithfulness of God that has brought me out of those things. And I can recount the faithfulness to God over and over and over again. Can I tell you something? It is really a powerful exercise of faith for you and I to go back and recount the faithfulness of God. In fact, on your outline there, we gave you a little blank. It says, God was faithful when. You see that? And then there's a box there. And you can just start listing some things. Man, I remember that time when God did this. I remember that time when God came through. I remember that time, maybe like Penny, when God came into my life and delivered me. I remember, I remember God's faithfulness. Can I tell you, I started a list like that, and then it had to become a note, and I started adding to and, and recounting the faithfulness of God, and this list isn't even nearly done. But can I tell you, I just want to challenge you to take some time today or this week to start recounting the faithfulness of God in your life. It'll be a faith-growing exercise. I'm, I'm asking you to make a list. Make a list, baby, of the things God's done for you. Let his love rain down on you who, because he was faithful in your past. I don't know. (laughs) I don't have a good ending. Remember the faithfulness of God. (laughs) I won't. (laughs) I did that so you'd remember to make a list. Make a list. Recount the faithfulness of your God. He's been faithful over and over and over again. And there were times you didn't know what was going to happen or how you were going to find a way out. And God made a way. Remember. You think about David. When, when Goliath was threatening the Israelites in 1 Samuel 17 and no one else in the army would go up against this nine foot tall giant, David said, I'll go. And he was a kid. He was a teenager. He said, you know why he would go? He said, because when I was a shepherd and a bear tried to take one of my sheep, God allowed me to slay the bear and get the sheep back or the, or the lion. And God had, he remembered that God had been faithful with the bear and the lion. He says, this Philistine's no different. That giant doesn't stand a chance because my God has been faithful before and he'll be faithful today. You will have confidence in the living God today when you realize God's faithfulness before. Rahab, this humble woman Rahab could do that. This woman saw what other people missed, that God was being faithful to his people. And she put her trust in him, that God is faithful as creator and sustainer and savior and defender and counselor and judge and ruler. God is able and he's faithful. Let me ask you a very pointed question. How can we blame God for the tragedies in our life and not praise him for the blessings and his faithfulness? We can't have it both ways. He's faithful. And you know what Rahab does in the middle of this crisis? Think about where she was. She literally knew everyone in this town she had lived in her whole life was going to be slaughtered. She knew it. It was happening. And in the middle of this crisis with her life and her family's lives on the line, she praises the one true living God. 
Some of you have been looking for a breakthrough this year, and I just want to point this out. Maybe your breakthrough is going to be this. Instead of complaining and doubting and fearing and hating the circumstances that God has brought you through, you take those crisis things in your life and you turn them back to praise to Almighty God. You turn them back to praise for all that he's done for you, and you see his handiwork in the crisis and how he's delivered you through it. That's a breakthrough. There's a couple key things. I say, how does, how does Rahab get that kind of faith? How does Rahab have that kind of confidence in God? How does somebody that knew nothing about this God arrive at these kind of conclusions? There's two critical truths I want, us, you to, want you to see in the passage we already read that really were the foundation for her trusting and having confidence in God. And the first one is this, that she affirmed that Israel's God had dominion over all the realms. In fact, she said, you're the God of uh, in heaven above and on earth below. You're the God in heaven above and earth below. That pretty much covers everything, right? She's saying, you're the God above all my gods. See, the Canaanite gods would have been the God of fertility and rain and the harvest and all these other things. And she's saying, no, no, you're the God over all those things. Those aren't gods. They're not worthy of my worship. You're the God that has sovereign control over all aspects of life. You are the one true God. And she trusted in the sovereign power of Almighty God. See, when you and I have things that we hang on to, when you put our confidence in anything other than him, he will, he will expose those things. He'll, he'll show their shortcomings and he'll, he'll make us realize that we should not have confidence in those things. Let me just tell you something. If you're going to grow in your confidence in God, there may be things in your life that you're hanging on to and, you've, and your confidence has been in your own ability or in your job or in the economy or the country you live in. God may need to strip those, your confidence in those things away in order order for you and I to find confidence in our God alone. You say, those aren't gods. Those, those aren't worthy of my worship. They're not worthy of my faith, but he is in him alone. So let me give you a few examples. So I don't think your job pays your bills. I don't think my job pays my bills, although I appreciate you guys being generous and so the church pays my bills. But I really believe it is God who pays the bills. How about you? I really believe it's God who sees you through when you have difficult circumstances. I believe God uses doctors and nurses and medical professionals and medicines to help him. But understand something. God is the one who heals and he chooses to use others in order to do so. Right? Can I tell you something? Uh, uh, last week, someone came up to me, and this happens every so often. They said, man, I don't, I don't know how you knew what was going on in my life this week, but man, what you preached was just right on time, exactly what I needed to hear. And I don't know how that, that happens, but thanks for, for giving the message last week. And, and a lot of times, I don't know what to say. I'll say thank you or praise God. You know, he gets the glory. But something came out last week when somebody said that. It finally really hits what I think I should have been saying all along. And what came out of my mouth was Hebrews 4.12. And I said, you know, the word of God is living and active. And it's sharper than a double-edged sword. And it penetrates the heart and the spirit. And it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And so when God speaks to you through his word, I want you to know something. It isn't me. It's the living God speaking to you. It's him. It's an important distinction. There isn't a single one of us that have made our way through this life on our own. We have had God's help. So our confidence is not found in our ability, but in God's sovereignty. That's the lesson Rahab had learned. That our confidence doesn't reside in what you and I can do in our, our, our promotion. Of it's literally just in the sovereignty of God. That when I'm in a situation, I don't know how to handle it. It's not up to me to fix it. It's not me to, to make it right. That, that I can just trust that God is bigger than my circumstances and he's bigger than my problems and he's bigger than whatever I'm facing and he'll find a way out. Because he's sovereign. And the eyes of faith trust God when, when others don't. Don't. 
Secondly, so she sees God as this sovereign God, and it, and it changes her view on things. Secondly, Rahab stated that Israel's God, Yahweh, that's a Jewish term, Yahweh was indeed the only God. I want you to go back to this verse again in Hebrews 11, uh, Joshua 2.11, and it says, For the Lord, you see that capital L-O-R-D, for the Lord your God is God. She's saying the Lord your God is God. And anytime in the English translation you see capital L-O-R-D, it is a translation from the Hebrew word Yahweh. It is the personal name of God. When you see capital L, then lowercase o-r-d, it's usually Adonai, which is an attribute of God, that he's the Lord Almighty. But when you see capital L-O-R-D, it's Yahweh. You know what's significant about that? That is the personal, covenant, intimate name of the living God is Yahweh. And when Moses was going to be used to deliver the people out of slavery, he said, listen, I don't even know your name, God. When they ask me who sent me to deliver him, what should I say? And he tells them, you tell them, Yahweh, I am that I am. Yahweh has sent you. I believe this is a serious turning point in Rahab's life. This is part of her comeback when she says, listen, God is, uh, God is not just the God of heaven and earth out there. That God is this intimate God that wants a relationship with us. And can I tell you something? Confidence is knowing God personally. You want a solid foundation to build your life. This is what I believe happened to, to Rahab. I believe we're going to meet her in heaven one day because she had faith in the living God. She knew him personally. She had called him by his name. And the God wasn't the God of heaven and earth out there somewhere, but God was now my God. The God of heaven is my God. Can I tell you something? There is nothing like knowing for certain that you are known by God and that you know him. That is the foundation for confidence in any of our lives. And if you don't know for certain that you know him personally, if there's any doubt in your heart or mind that you don't have a personal relationship with the living God, at the end of this message, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond just like Rahab did and say, listen, this living God who loves me, I want to know him like Rahab knows. I want to know him like Penny knows him. I want to know the living God. Before we get to that, let me just see. There's at least three benefits to having confidence in God right out of the text. And so I'm going to give these to you pretty quick. First of all is this. Confidence in God will make a way. Confidence in God will make a way. So back to our narrative here. The, 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 the spies had interacted with Rahab. They made a deal. She gets them out of the city. They go back and they come back and attack. But God, don't have time to explain all this, but God supernaturally conquers Jericho for them. And then, then we pick up the narrative in chapter 6. It says, then they burned the whole city and everything in it. But they put the silver and the gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. Now, there's no way this story should have ended like this. There's no way that a pagan prostitute should end up living in the company of the people of God, under the blessing of God, in the, with the word of God. I mean, just an incredible story and in how that all happened. See, here's what I believe. God makes a way when there's no way. I believe our God does the impossible and he does the illogical. And there's no, when, when you think there is no way out and there's no chance it's going to get better and there's no way uh, I'm going to improve and there's no way my life can be different, then God says, but confidence in me will make a way. Anybody want to give me an amen on that? Amen. You ever had that time where you thought there is no way out and yet somehow, some way, God made a way. You can just ask Daniel someday when he spent the whole night in a cave with hungry lions and they shut him in all night and they opened it up the next day and Daniel had not been touched. You can ask Daniel about the God who makes a way. You can ask three men who were thrown into a fiery furnace so hot the person that threw them in got consumed by the fire and they walked around in the fire untouched. God made a way. You may be able to sit and talk to the person next to you and say, hey, tell me about the time that God made a way when you thought there was no way. Can I tell you just a little bit of faith in a really big God? There's a way. There's a way. I'm going to tell you what happened to me uh, eight days ago. I got an email about a bill I got from a hospital 
Um, most of you don't know this, but the night before Thanksgiving, I was, I'd had some abdominal pains for a few days and it got pretty bad. And, and so we Googled it. We're like, what does this mean? And we're like, it could be appendicitis. I'm like, that doesn't sound good. So, um, <laughs> so I called my mom who was an ER nurse for years. And I say, Hey, what do you think about? So he's like, you need to go to the hospital, go to the ER. I'm like, Okay, you always do what mom says. So, so I go to the ER. And so Gabe takes me over there. And, you know, I was worried about it rupturing or whatever. So we went to the closest hospital. It wasn't in network. That was my bad. Uh, but we went there. They took care of us. I got the bill eight days ago. And it was $11,000. And that's, that was my reaction. I was like, oh, my gosh, that's a big bill. And my heart started to get gripped with fear. And I started wondering where that money was going to come from and how this is going to happen and what, how, what, what am I going to do and what do I got to sell and what kid do I got to sell was my first thought. <clears throat> I don't know what I could get for him, but love y'all. <laughs> but then I thought, you know what? It's time to put up or shut up with my faith in God and my God's going to make a way. And, I, and I, the story hasn't been ended. I don't know how this is going to happen. I'm just telling you, there's no way I'm paying $11,000. I just, I just know because that can't happen, it's not going to happen. And you might think I'm stupid or crazy or I've lost my head, but I just believe God's going to make a way. He makes a way. Secondly, confidence in God will cause you to stand out. It's going to cause you to stand out. Uh, It says this in Hebrews 11. This is, by the way, the faith chapter. If you want to read about the heroes of our faith, read Hebrews chapter 11. It says, by faith, the prostitute Rahab. So she makes the list. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Everyone else in that city dies. Yet because of her bold actions and her bold faith, she and her family are spared. Can I tell you something? When you get a confidence in God, it will make you bold. One of my favorite Proverbs is 28.1. It says, the wicked flee, though no one pursues them, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. God, confidence in him, knowing he's sovereign, knowing he's got you, knowing he can make in a way, it makes you and I bold. And God will love it when you stand in faith in him. Other people might think you're crazy. They may not like you. May they think you're screwy, but confidence in God makes you bold. You know what? God loves faith. Hebrews 11 also says, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who believes in him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Faith to trust the living God makes us bold. Let me just ask you, you willing to stand out for God? You willing to stick out for God? You willing to look different for God? Your confidence in God is so great that you're not going to respond the way other people respond. Your confidence is so great in God that you're not going to shrink back when an opportunity presents itself. Are you willing to stick out and stand out for God? Lastly, confidence in God will allow you to be used greatly by him. Now, I know all of you like to go home on Saturday, Sunday afternoons and read all the genealogies of your Bible, right? Just over and over, begat, 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 right? Uh, there's a reason they're in there, and there's one from Matthew 1 that's actually, I'm going to show you why it's in there, I believe. And so Matthew chapter 1, verse 5 says this. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. God allowed Rahab to be the great whatever mother of King David. And then King Solomon. And then on down the line, King Jesus. (laughs) You're telling me this pagan prostitute was a great, great whatever grandmother of our Savior? Are you kidding me? Only God can tell that story. Only God can do that kind of comeback. Only God's got that sense of humor. (laughs) What a God. See, I believe this. The greater our confidence in the God, the greater he can use us. The greater our confidence in God, the greater he'll use us. It's called faith. I'm going to read you one more passage from Hebrews 11. It says this. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith 
conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. Listen, followers of the living God, you need to know what your heritage is, your spiritual, spiritual heritage. Your spiritual heritage is simply this. You come from a long line of people who have trusted God and boldly trusted him so much so that God did amazing things through them. We're descendants of those people by faith. We get to follow in their footsteps by faith. We get to have the same stories told through us by faith. Now, let me just challenge you. I'm going to just challenge all of us that we're going to live this year confident in God. Regardless of what the circumstance throw at us, we're going to be confident in God. Because listen, if God can take a woman of ill repute and turn her into a hero of the faith, God can make a comeback in your life and in my life. Amen? Amen. That's right. Let me just ask you this, though. What is your confidence in? Is it in an organization, an institution? Is it in yourself? Or does your confidence reside in the living God? That's where confidence comes from, trusting in the living God. This year is going to be different as you and I place our confidence in him and let him make us bold and let him make us brave and to use us greatly for him and to see him make a way and allow that, realize that his sovereign plan is supreme and we can trust it. He's going to make a way. Look, I know a lot of you have been looking for a breakthrough this year. And by the way, after the last service, I heard people come up to me. And it was just incredible to hear some of the breakthroughs that are happening in people's lives. And I just give God praise for it. It's by his hand. And uh, as you and I are looking for a breakthrough, I mean, the first week in the series, we talked about coming back to God and looked at the life of Moses. And we realized there's lessons in the wilderness that we have to learn in that time of darkness and hardship, Right? And then last week, we looked at this story of Lazarus, how God raised this man from the dead, and that God wants to bring us back to life and, and break the shackles of sin and, and, and habitual sin in our life, and it can free us. And that could be our breakthrough this year. But I think the lesson from Rahab is for all of us is simply this, is we need to trust God enough to wait on his timing and then act when he calls us to act. Because I believe sometimes God's waiting for us to act. And we keep saying, well, God, when you, when you make this breakthrough happen, then I'll respond. And sometimes God is saying, I've done my part. Now it's time for you to do yours. To act on what you know I'm telling you to act upon. By faith, trusting me and stepping out in boldness. And listen. Listen. If you don't have that firm, solid foundation of knowing you have a personal relationship with the living God, there is no single greater need in your life to come to a relationship with him. That he longs to know you and love you, to forgive you from all your sin. Understand this, though. This barrier that has kept you from knowing God is our self-confidence, is our self-reliance, and in our, in our lacking of morality. It's called sin. That's what the Bible calls sin. And Jesus Christ came and paid for the sin that you've done in order to remove it from your, your bank account in order that you might be free and clear before the living God and come into a relationship with him. By faith in Jesus Christ, turning from your sin and saying, God, I no longer want to follow this way. I want to follow Jesus and the life he offers. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we give you thanks today. You are the God of comebacks. And in you, we can live a life not of fear, not of doubt, not of worry, not of anxiety. We can live confident in you. God, I pray for the person that is on shaky ground this morning. And they're just wondering about this relationship with you. And it just doesn't seem to be nailed down. And they say, I just don't know that I know him like I'm supposed to. I mean, I've heard about him, but I don't know that I know the living God. You don't know the living God until you invite him into your life. Have you done that today? Have you ever done that? If that's where you are and you're ready to invite the living God in, realize all he asks is repentance. 
turning from your sin in yourself and trusting in his son Jesus and what he's done for you. Are you willing to make that trade today? Turning from the sin of, in yourself to turning to a living Savior who loves you and died in your place. With everybody's eyes closed, I'm just wondering, you wanna know God in a personal way, would you just slip your hand up today and say, I'm ready to invite Christ into my life. Just me and you. It's just a, an act of faith between you and the Lord. Say, I'm ready to invite Christ into my life. I'm turning from my sin and I'm turning to my Savior. Let me pray for you. Say, God, I'm, I want to I want to know what it means to know you. I want to have this life-changing encounter like Rahab, like Penny's had. I want the one true God to be, be alive in me. And so I, I admit it, Lord, I've done things that have kept me away from you because I've directed my own life and my sin is piled up. But today I believe by faith that Jesus came to remove all those things in order for me to have a relationship with you. And I turn from those things and I turn to Jesus Christ. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me and I ask you to come into me and lead me from this day forward. And God, I pray for your people that we would be people of confidence in a great God. Just a little bit of faith in a big God changes everything. And so God, help us to recount your faithfulness. Let us not skip that exercise. Let's go back and just remember how incredibly faithful you've been. God, let us not be people that trust in our own ability, but we trust in your sovereignty. And if you feel stuck today, I just pray God would grant you the faith and you say, God, I don't know how you're gonna do it, but I believe today you're gonna make a way. Make that your prayer. Or maybe your prayer is, God, I, I believe you now. I want to be bold. I want to stick out. I want to be different. I want, to, I want my faith to grow this year. Or maybe it's like, God, I, I, want, you, I want to trust you enough that you'll use me however you want to use me. God, we offer these prayers to you. Would you take them and use them for your glory? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus
Church, you guys have a seat for me. Uh, thank you guys for not leaving when Rod decided to sing, make a list. So uh, thank you guys very much for that. So uh, whenever you guys came in, you got this. You filled out the front part. On the back part, there's just a couple of things. Uh, I, will t I will take confident action, trusting God for a breakthrough. Um, so mark that if that's you. The, the second one's the most important one, though. Um, I am declaring today for the first time that God is my God. If that is you today, please mark that so we can celebrate that with you, walk you through that process, and just be there for you. Because that's a big deal. And it's kind of hard to just stop and make your life better because I'm going to tell you, your life's not going to instantly get better. It's going to be better, but there's some work to do. You can't just run out and everything's going to change. So we want to be that group for you. Um, we have Connect to Baptism February 14th and Connect to Crossroads January 31st. So if you have any interest in going to those, please mark those down. Um, I'm about to pray for the offering, but I did want to kind of tell you guys what your offering does. So we've had three people come up here and tell their testimony, and all three of them have gone to CR and has changed their life. That's one thing that contributions do is it doesn't necessarily go to the church and give lights and all that stuff. It does all that. It doesn't necessarily build the wing and it does that. It goes to people. So the people in here is what's important, and that's what we give to. That's what we try to impact. My favorite thing about this church, hands down, is in the staff meetings, it's not about how much money we can raise. It's not about anything else that you would think a church of this size would do. It's about how can we impact people. And trust me, a lot of you guys know me in here pretty well. I'm a pretty cynical person whenever it comes to especially mega churches and all that stuff. That is not what this church does. It is all about the people. So know confidently that that's what you're doing. Also, those that have given their testimony, can we give them a round of applause for a second? Because we all have sentences and chapters in our book that we don't want to read out loud, right? I know I do, and there's no way in this world I'm going to tell you guys my deep, dark secrets up here. So it's very brave of, of Penny and Don and, and you guys that have done that. So thank you so much. I'm going to pray for our offering, then we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank you so much for, for just your word today. Thank you for the, 
the people here that have heard your word and, uh, and just thank you for loving us, even though we don't always love you back the way that we should. I pray for the, the offering and the blessings that we're about to give this church, and I pray that the church uses those to your will and glory. I, I pray that you guide those directions, and, and I pray that they bring more people to your kingdom and, and allow you to show your love more. In your name we pray. Amen. Things are in the back for you guys to drop off your donations and these cards. You guys have a great weekend. Hey, thanks for following online today. We're so glad that you watched the videos. In fact, we want to continue to see you do so. Would you do us a favor uh, if, these, if these videos are ministering to you and God's using them in your life? Subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can stay current with the new videos being uh, put on our channel. And also, uh, go the extra step and, and ring that bell or punch that bell right there below. And you can uh, be alerted when we get a new video online. Uh, and by all means, please, if you could take a second and fill out the online connect card as a way to come back to us with any feedback or a way God ministered to you, we'd love to get those back from you as well. Have a great week. God bless you. Let's follow Jesus.